afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us for another episode of Condo Insider. Uh, my name is Jane Sugimura, and I'm your uh, host for today's show. And I'm really pleased to have with uh, as my guest today, uh, Tyler Das uh, uh, Santos uh, Tam, and he's running for the city council uh, seat for district number six, uh, because Carol uh, Fukunaga, who uh, currently holds that uh, seat, is uh, term limited, and so it's going to be an open seat. And you know, this is part of a series of uh, programs that I'm going to be doing uh, for maybe the rest of uh, this year. I want to introduce Condo Insider viewers to candidates who are running for office, and uh, and ask them questions about you know how they you know how they're going to support the the condo residents like you and me who live in their district and you know so this will hopefully give you some uh information uh that will uh, lead to you know a really important decision it's in august isn't it the primary primaries in august but people are going to get their ballots in the mail in late july so it's oh. even sooner Oh, okay. Well, okay. Tyler, thank you for being with me today. Why don't you, uh, why don't you tell us something about yourself? Sure. I know you're well, board president of a condo. Yes, media. we'll get to that. Um, so I'm Tyler Dos Santos Tam, and it's a great pleasure to be here on Condo Insider. Um, as Jane mentioned, I'm the president of my condo association at 801 South Street. Um, we're at one of the newer buildings, but we're one of the largest condo associations. There's about 1,040 um, units uh, in this property. It's both buildings A and B. I grew up um, here in town. I grew up right by Natsunoya Tea House up in Aleva Heights, and I was on the Laliha Neighborhood Board for six years. But the district that I'm running for, City Council District 6, goes from Ward Avenue to Middle Street, so it's got half of the Kakako condos, all those condos up in Nuuanu and downtown, you know, Chinatown, um, as well as some of those up on Punchbowl, up on the slopes of Punchbowl. So it is a big area and lots of associations. And then, of course, you know, some of the private subdivisions as well have their own associations um, up in the valley. And so, you know, uh, why, are you, why are you running for the city council seat? Well, I was on the Laliha Neighborhood Board for six years, and I definitely saw how the city government affects people's lives. From the time that you wake up and, and cook breakfast, that's city water, take a shower, City water, you go to um, you know, work or school on a city road or a city sidewalk if you walk. And then you, know, you, you curl up in bed and uh, brush your teeth at night. And you know, you've, you've dealt with a whole bunch of city issues all day long. And for condo owners uh, in particular, you know, the way that we interact with um, city government's a little bit different, right? We often have private uh, trash pickup and, and things like that. And we have to deal with our own sort of water distribution once it gets off, um, you know, the city lines. And so, you know, there's a lot of things where I, I saw as a neighborhood board member and a resident of community where the city has to step up and the city can be proactive and be a partner um, in, in helping people, you know, live uh, the best life that they can here on this island. And I'd like to step up and serve our community and be a leader who can get that done. Okay. And, you know, um, and I, I, I've lived in, you know, con I've been living in condos for many, many years in, in uh, IEA. And, you know, one thing what I've learned, and I've been advocating for condos for over 30 years of the state legislature and city and county. What I find out that I spend more time educating people because people don't understand what it's like living in condominiums. They think we have a ton of money. Uh, you know, so, 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 you know, they, they think, they say, oh, well, you know, you live in a condominium, so uh, you should be paying more because there's more of you. It's like, excuse me, you know, uh, and, you know, so, you know, we have issues like you mentioned with the city rubbish removal, right? Single family homeowners, they pay real property taxes and they get free rubbish removal. Yep. But if you live in a condominium, I mean, you, you pay real property taxes and you look at a condominium building with maybe 300 units and look at the property taxes, if, if each unit pays $1,000 a year uh, with 300, I mean, that's what, $300,000? That's right. a ton of money. And we, we have to pay for our own rubbish pickup and our rubbish pickup is, you know, it's not peanuts. It's like 5,000, right. 6,000 a month. And that comes out of our, our homeowners' pockets. And, you know, so, uh, you know, a, a, a lot of times, you know, we're in, we're, we're at the city council, uh, you know, grumbling about how come you guys are discriminating against us. I mean, uh, and with the bulky item pickup, uh, you know, we have this thing about the fines and it's like, but, you know, and I live in a loop. 
but we have a bunch of condos. And this may sound silly like children, but you know, they, the, 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 uh, with bulky item pickup, you know, you have to, you can't put it out early. You have to put it out like the night before. Right, right. Right. And, and, the, and the thing about it is, is when you live in an area where there's a lot of condos right in the block, and especially in the cul-de-sac, and we have six condominium projects on the, uh, on the loop. And so you, somebody sees something being put out, they yep. know it's, and all of a sudden, other people sort of start bringing stuff. And it's like, wait a minute, it's not fair, because that's our sidewalk. You, you, you they, the people from across the street will walk over and put their stuff on our area. And that means that if the bulky item people don't come and pick it up, we have to remove it. Otherwise, we get fined because we're the property owners. And, you know, so it's like, do we post guards out there to tell the neighbors to to not put their stuff on our, you know, but you know, it 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 creates some issues, and you know, so we I, I'm glad when you know they set that program up. They asked our group, you know, to to kind of assist them, and you know, we 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 sent out emails to all the different associations, asked them for feedback, and what kind of issues are you know were they dealing with, so that we could tell the Department of Environmental Services, you know, how to because the, 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 it was a pilot program for a while. But, you know, we have worked with the city on issues like that. And, you know, and I can remember going to hearings for John DeSoto years ago. He wanted to change the rate that uh, that condominiums get charged for water and sewer. Hmm. And we we get charged a lower rate than single family homes. But and he was saying that that's not fair. We should be paying the same rate. It's like, no, because you have, you know, maybe 300 people, but there's only one pipe coming from the city right. you know and we, it's and not like we've got 300 fights that, that were you know and and so it it was a long hard fight we had to fight with them with the city when you know so that we, we we so it's it's you know there's this ongoing relationship with the city for day daily you know issues like like you said water sewer uh, rubbish removal and it's all and property taxes property taxes we're always dealing with the city and so it is it's so you can you know if you're going to be sitting on the council you're going to be dealing with issues that you know affect people who live in condominiums in your district so you know yep. it's it's important for 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 people in your district to know that you're the go-to person when these things happen yep and again as a president of my condo association and as a condo you know resident myself um I, I can assure your viewers that you know they'll have a sympathetic ear um, if I'm elected and, and somebody who you know is willing to dive into these issues and it's it, they're ongoing issues um, that that keep on coming up and of course there there are some changes probably in, in some of the policies that are going to affect condos and, and that's going to spill over into the next term. Yes, and you know one one thing I want to bring up because it was introduced there was a, 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 a an ordinance introduced in. Um, 2017, and it was passed in 2018, the fire safety ordinance because of the Marco Polo fire in, in July of 2017. And we all agree that was a horrific event. It was just the most, it was really, really awful. And, um, and but you know, what happened uh, and you know, some of us, including me think that you know, the mayor at the time, it was a knee-jerk reaction. He decided he wanted to mandate fire sprinklers in all high-rise residential buildings. And we, and there was a lot of pushback. The, that's why, it, it, you know, the ordinance did not pass until 2018. And when it did eventually pass, there was an alternative. In other words, it wasn't, you shall, everybody shall, you know, put in fire sprinklers. And it wasn't because we were concerned about safety. I mean, I think most buildings in town thought that they were safe, right. but and that they were being somehow penalized uh, because of what happened at the Marco Polo. But you know, they want it, it's expensive, and nobody in town had money in their reserves to pay for a fire sprinkler system, it, which exactly. cost millions of dollars. And you even know, if they did have money, they were already planning for, you know, maintenance to the elevator, maintenance to, you know, the painting the outside of the building, made a number of other things they probably had planned for years. Yes. And to have this dropped into their lap um, is clearly a, a big burden that they never were prepared for. And, and there's no way to be prepared for um, in a short amount of time. 
Right. And, you know, so what and, and our group was part of the task force. We were appointed to the task force that came up with the alternative. And the alternative was that if you didn't want to put in sprinklers, you could do a life safety evaluation. And that's where a licensed professional would come and inspect the building and tell you how to make it safer. OK, because these are all older buildings. We all recognize that we could probably make things better to make it safer to address the concerns that were raised by, you know, the uh, bill. And so, you know, so that was, a, and that was cheaper. It was cheaper, more economical, you know, for, for the, uh, and you know, because a lot of people didn't like it because they, it still meant that they had to spend money. And so it wasn't like it was, you know, everybody was, you know, in favor of it, but it was better than, you know, putting in sprinklers. And so, Back in 2018, we agreed to that. And here we are, here we are four years later and the bill is in the process of being implemented. And we're finding out that we are, there are so many problems. There are over 360 buildings that were originally on the list that were subject to the fire safety ordinance. About 60 of them are exempt from sprinklers because they're under 10 stories or smaller, or they have open exterior corridors. And the fire department has deemed that that's safe. They don't have to you know, put in sprinklers. So they're exempt from sprinklers. And there are buildings in, in Waikiki, like the Wailana or the Waipuna, Yacht Harbor Tower. They're open exterior quarters. They're big buildings, but they have open exterior quarters. They don't have to do sprinklers. And, and so, um, the life safety evaluation is, you know, I think out of 300 buildings, the, and, I, and I get copies of the reports that the fire department submits to the city. And the last report was April, not April. It was uh, March of, uh, it was, in fact, it was a month ago. Mm. And about 240 buildings have submitted their LSEs. Okay, so almost all the buildings have submitted the LSE. Do you know how many have passed, have gotten past these scores? Right, it's a very small number, right? 16. That's a 16, tiny fraction. 16 out of 247 wow. buildings. That means that you got over 200 buildings in Honolulu who don't have passing scores, who technically have to put in fire sprinklers or do something else, okay? And here we are in 2022. But on top of that, we had a pandemic that happened in 2020 that kind of shut everybody down, which delayed the life safety evaluations from being done. So we got an extension because our deadline for completing the life safety was last year. Okay, and then so it was extended to May 3rd of this year. And Carol Fukunaga submitted a, a, another bill recently that was signed by the mayor. I think he signed it last week, yeah. Bill 37. And so the deadline for completing your LSE is now August of this year. So it's what, May, June, July, four more months yeah. to, for about 60 buildings. Right. But, our, but in order to uh, get a passing score, I mean, what are, are the, the next deadline for us, because my building has, we, we did our LSE in January of 2021, and our deadline for compliance is May 3rd, 2025. That's three years away. We couldn't put in fire sprinklers even if we wanted to, because that's we don't have enough time. We are one of what over 200 buildings in Honolulu that have to get building permits. Right. Building permits, yep. and and we we testified before the city council weeks a couple of weeks ago, and we basically said, "What are you guys going to do? Here we are. There's over 200 of us, and and we, you know all of us have to get. You know, if we have to do fire sprinklers, we have to get building permits. How are we going to do this? And how are we going to get it all done by May 3rd, 2025? Right. Well, as you know, my background is actually in the construction industry, and of course the. Permit backlog at DPP is one of the, the biggest frustrations, I think, for the industry. And so we share that um, not only with condos, but the contractors who are doing this work. It holds up their ability to get things done, too. And so um, having that background and running for the council, if I do get in on the council, you know, we're going to um, DPP is going to be one of my big focuses because there are so many things that um, DPP 
you know, could be, be very proactive and, and help people with getting things like this done, helping people, you know, we talk about getting to uh, solar clean energy. I mean, this is um, something that also is, is being held up sometimes in permitting. And of course, just people wanting to do renovations, whether it's um, in, in a unit or whether it's, you know, in their single family home. I mean, there's all of these things that are being backed up. And it, it sometimes is a difference between, you know, life or death. And it is the difference between paying, you know, a certain amount now, or who knows how much it's going to be in 2025, if we have to wait and wait and wait for a permit. And so it really is, you know, something that we need to fix. And, you know, I'm willing to roll up my sleeves and um, get really uh, acquainted with, with the, the folks down at DPP and say, you know, what can we do better? And how can we get this done? Because it is so important to so many people um, who live in condos here on this island. Right. And, you know, uh, another thing, too, uh, you know, what we're finding out, be because back in 2018, you know, when we were working on this ordinance to begin with, um, no, no, like I said, nobody knew we were going to have a pandemic. Right. So, so then now we had the pandemic and the pandemic has resulted in what they call supply chain right. shortages. Right. So even and we're, a lot of us who have completed our LSCs, we've had to do little repairs, you know, fixing our doors, uh, you know, you know, getting getting some, and, and we have to wait longer to get right. these products into Hawaii. Plus, it costs us more money. And 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 so this is all, you know, and and two things happened in 2022 that were nobody knew about it. We found out early in, in I think January of this year that insurance premiums for high rise buildings with no fire sprinklers were going to go up. And it's not because of anything that happened in Hawaii. It wasn't because right, of, right. Uh, of the Marco Polo fire. It was because the local uh, insurance carriers uh, have to, you know, when, when they have to pay out claims, they borrow from a reinsurance and they're offshore, you know, companies. And those companies also give money to pay for the wildfires that are happening on the mainland for the condo collapse that happened in Florida, for the, the storms that are happening in Europe and damaging buildings. And oh. the, we understand that the, the industry has suffered a loss of over a hundred billion dollars. And because of that, the insurance industry has to recoup their money. So they're going to start increasing premiums. The, my, insurance, my insurance premium in 2022, we found out in January of this year, went up 30% and went up $44,000. Yep. And in our building, it, it did as well. We paid in 2020 about 300, just shy of 300,000 uh, to insure both of the buildings. And this year, this past year, it went up to 600,000. Um, and, and that is a huge amount. And we, of course, have to explain to our you know, owners that this is sort of out of our control. And, and we have to unfortunately raise the fees. And of course, nobody likes that. And it's, again, out of our control here. Um, so, you know, going back to some things we can control in the city, you know, how can we think about this in a logical way that's practical and isn't going to be a burden that just falls out of the sky and, and hits everyone out of, out of nowhere, you know? Right. And, 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 and see, for, for buildings who have done their LSE and have to comply with fire safety ordinance, now they have less money, less right. money because now their insurance premiums went up and even the buildings that have the open exterior quarters like the Wailana and the Yacht Harbor, their insurance went up. And so we're trying to set up a meeting with the insurance commissioner to say, you know, there's this ordinance and it expressly says that open exterior corridors and small buildings under 10 stories are safe. They are exempt from fire sprinklers. So, so you know, why are you allowing the insurance companies to raise their insurance rates? I mean, you can't be doing this across the board type of thing it's not fair and you know so uh, you know and 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 for implement and and you know this increase in the insurance is creating problems with complying with life safety i mean you have you know over 200 buildings including mine we're trying to figure out how we comply with life safety uh, i mean the, the fire uh, ordinance now we you know have less money because we had to pay uh, an insurance increase and we found out the second unintended consequence is Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. They're the federal agencies who loan, who, who buy loans from local lenders. 
and they came out with a directive. Fannie Mae's directive, I think, is uh, effective in January of 2022, and Freddie Mac was uh, effective in February. And what that says is that, you know, if you have these problems and if you have a, uh, a, a report, a detrimental report having to do with your structure and it's filed with a regulatory agency. And the minute I saw that, I figured, oh my God, that's the life safety evaluation that's filed right. with the fire department. And how, there's over 200 buildings in, in Honolulu that are that way. That means that even now, if you want to do a fire sprinkler and you, and, and typically, because we don't have money in our reserves, you go out and you borrow money. We can't even right. get a loan. Yeah. And, and, you know, because we're not eligible, because now we have a detrimental structural report filed with a regulatory agency. And, and you, know, at, at, and, you know, some people say, well, and, you know, well, how are they going to know? And are they going to put things into effect? I'm the board president of my condominium. I'm getting calls. Yep. from realtors representing prospective buyers and i got a call from a financial institution you know saying we are too oh, well, and we're in yeah. the building and we're still getting this um they want, and, as they're asking me about reserves yep. asking me about raising maintenance fees that are we going to do that and what about you know the fire safety ordinance are we in compliance and you know i i don't want to say well we're not in, we're you know we still have time we still have until 2025 and so it's not yeah we're trying we're, we're we're not quite in compliance but we're trying to get there and it's just really difficult and you know carol fukunaga set up a permitted interaction group and i was part of that group and we we testified before the city council and i wasn't the only one there was a uh, Jonathan Billings from uh, Touchstone Properties, and we had uh, some uh, somebody from uh, uh, Hawaiiana, and we had Sue Savio, you know, for the insurance yeah. industry, and we had a lot. Of, and, and basically, the bottom line is is these unintended consequences are making it very difficult for condominiums to comply with this fire safety ordinance. And so it should be suspended, repealed, but something has to happen because if, 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 if you know, the, the deadlines don't change, I mean, you're, you're gonna have 200 buildings, you know, right. in, in, in it's, it's, a, it's gonna be an awful mess. And, and you know, a, a lot of these um, lending requirements, you know, a lot of these older buildings are kind of where people, you know, young couples maybe are getting their first apartment, their, their first place that they can buy. And if you're getting caught up in this, uh, this Fannie Mae requirement and you can't buy into or can't get a loan for a unit in somewhere with a black mark, whereas a cash buyer can simply just come in and take it. I mean, this really is detrimental to the sort of affordable housing issue that we have here of getting people into their first place that, that they, you know, um, can raise a family in or, you know, downsize into whatever the case may be. Um, so there, there's that connection too between housing affordability and uh, everything that's going on in this industry right now. And, you know, so, I mean, how would you feel about, you know, suspending the fire safety ordinance until, until we can figure out what's going to happen? We know with the insurance issue, as soon as the insurance industry can recoup, you know, those increases should stop. But I've been told it's going to go on for at least another two or three years until and right. and, and and you know with this directive, I mean we've already reached out to our Congress people. I know CAI International has um, uh, reached out to their uh, national lobbyists to you know talk to people in Congress to try to get Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to uh, suspend you know implementation of their directives. I mean, because, I mean, it's going to create a, a really a, a horrible mess, it's, it's yeah. especially with the housing situation. And you're absolutely right. This is going to be an all hands on deck issue from the federal government to the state side, which regulates insurance, you know, within the state of Hawaii. But on the county side, you know, the fact that there's still, there are still uh, over 100, maybe 160 buildings that still need to get their LSE completed, haven't done that yet, are in the process, even if they complete it, then they have to implement things. I mean, this is really a tight, maybe an impossibly tight deadline. And so we're gonna have to look at that. But you know, I think if, if you're taking steps and many of them are going to, to take steps to implement the other LSE things besides the fire sprinklers, the alarms, you know, other things, uh, I'm happy to see that they're, they're doing that. And hopefully that satisfies um, you know, those people who are very, very concerned about safety. It's not just the sprinklers, there's other things that we can do 
to improve safety. And like, let's get there first. Those things we can do, it'll promote safety um, without being overly burdensome. Right. Um, and, you know, what we need to do, too, is, if, you know, we don't suspend enforcement. We've got to extend the deadlines. Like I said, you know, it's only three years before, you know, the, the compliance deadline, you know, is in place. And even, in, you know, like we have done all of our little repairs. And so the issue right now is whether we do the fire alarm system, which means that it might cost us a little under a million dollars, which is still a chunk of change. Yeah. Or put in sprinklers and for our building it's going to cost about three and a half million and you know right. so I, I have you know and when we have these meet, we had two meetings on this I mean we had a we had a you know a substantial amount of owners who usually don't ever show up but they showed up for that because they they you know they said if you you know we were we told them if you don't show up we're going to install fire sprinklers right. so naturally you know it, you know they 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 kind of all showed up and um but you know, for the fire alarm systems, we still need the building permits. Correct. Right. Exactly. So and, we and need I to have we... we need to have a fast track method. If you know, if, if the city, in other words, if the city wants us wants to help us comply, they got to give us the means, and they control exactly. the permitting prop process. And like I said, there's now over 200 buildings out there that are going to need permits if they're going to do fire alarms or fire sprinklers. And right now, there's not, you know, none of us can see a way how the city can do that. Right. And, and this brings me, I think, to something that's going on right now at the council, which is Bill 44, which creates a fund, you know, to help condos with this, which I think, you know, is great and clearly, you know, would support but in addition to simply the funding, it's all the mechanics behind that, right? So, you know, we could create a fund, but if everyone's gonna sit in line to get a building permit and everyone's still waiting to complete their LSE and everybody's waiting for all the parts to arrive from, you know, uh, China or Japan or Korea, wherever it's coming from, right. the fund itself is not simply gonna be the solution. So we need an all, you know, all of the above approach, which includes, you know, the fund from Bill 44. And then of course the question is how do we, get money into there and of course get it out to you know the the these associations that are trying to do good for the residents right and you know what's really you know kind of strange in the pig in the permitted interaction group uh discussion we found out that there are some buildings the reason why they have another lse they really think that the bill is going to be repealed um, and we keep telling them that you can't rely on that because it i mean that may happen who knows but you cannot wait until the last minute because you're going to get dinged and you know right now you you have most of the buildings in honolulu you know have done their lse like i said there's over 200 who have not gotten passing scores but you know most at of least them, they tried right made a good faith effort that's right you know that's at what least we've got we've got the report we know what's got to get fixed right so you know we're halfway there and the problem is now we're dealing with enforcement. How do we how do we get our permits? How do we get our supplies and materials? And how do we get the money to pay for all of this besides paying for our insurance increases, you know, because of the, you know, uh, the insurance market and paying for everything else that goes with, you know, trying to maintain an aging building. That's that's what we are all dealing with. There's definitely a lot to work on in the next city council, especially those who represent areas like District 6 with a lot of condos are going to have their hands full working on it. But I'm ready to roll up my sleeves and work with uh, all the stakeholders to try to get something done that's practical, that's you know reasonable, and isn't going to be a huge burden that's a total surprise you know, to everybody involved. Right, because like I said, you know, when we started this process, we, we, we negotiated in good faith with the city. We came up with the alternative of, a, of an LSE as an alternative to installing sprinklers. And if, if we didn't have a pandemic, if we didn't have the insurance increase and the, uh, the lenders, you know, directives, the Fannie Mae and Freddie, then maybe we wouldn't be grumbling. We may probably be, but not as much. But right now, it, it, it's gotten to the point where, where you, you see a lot of frustration out there in the associations saying, how are we going to do this? And, you know, I'm glad to hear that you're willing to, you know, roll up your sleeves and work with us and try to figure out how to do this. Yeah, happy to. And thanks for the opportunity to be on the show. Yeah, well, thanks, uh, Tyler, for being here. 
and we've run out of time. So I want to thank the uh, listeners and viewers uh, for uh, joining uh, us on this episode of Kano Insider, uh, where I'm uh, interviewing candidates who are running for elected office in 2022. It's gonna be an exciting year. We're gonna get a whole lot of new elected officials. And, uh, but for condo people, uh, I, I urge you to learn, get to know your candidates, invite them into your buildings and do coffee hours, ask some questions, hard questions, because these elected officials are gonna be making decisions that affect your day-to-day -day living. So you better get to know them, Bet, get, you, know, you gotta be their best friends. And, and hopefully, you know, that will be the case with you, Tyler, and we can come and rumble to you and you can be our knight in shining armor in the city council. My door is always open. Well, thank you very much for being with us, Tyler. And thank you uh, to our viewers for joining us for this episode of Connor Insider. Please join us next week for another uh, episode. It will be Raylene Tenno, who will be your host for the show. Thank you and mahalo. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.